questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my question is to the Prime Minister. On average, Australian women retire with 40 per cent less in their superannuation. Well, that's approximately $113,000 less. And many single women retire into poverty. Will the Prime Minister therefore support Labor's plan to invest $400 million to strengthen Australian superannuation system, boost women's super and help Australian women plan for a secure and independent financial future? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the, uh, the member for his question and the government will consider all options in this area, but I do want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that when superannuation reforms were taken through this parliament, uh, when I was treasurer, I was disappointed that the opposition didn't support important measures that would have assisted women with catch-up contributions in their superannuation. That was a part of the package, Mr. Speaker, where we introduced the low-income superannuation tax offset, and that benefits around 1.9 million women. Uh, by over $500 million, uh, the levelling of the playing field by scrapping restrictions Prime on who can pause. make— Prime Minister will pause for a second. Look, the members for Fenner, Griffith and Hotham are already interjecting loudly, as they've done in recent days. They'll cease interjecting. Members on both sides will listen to the answer. The Prime Minister has to call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There was the level of the playing field by scrapping the restrictions on those who can make personal deduction contribution. Now that benefited some 800,000 Australians, including those women, in working in roles without access to formal salary sacrificing arrangements. Now, one of the, the real changes that is occurring across our economy is the start-up of new home-based businesses, which many women, particularly in family roles, are taking on around the country. Now, we've ensured as a, as a government, our government has ensured, that they can get access to the same superannuation tax concessions that anyone else out there working in a normal wage and salary earning job, and we have legislated to do that. These were part of the major changes that we introduced. On top of that, there was the catch up concessional contributions, and that will benefit some 230,000 Australians, Mr. Speaker, and the Labor Party opposed that. So, where you have women who have gone out of the workforce for a period of time, and they're in a position to try and do catch-up contributions in the future to catch up when they go back to work, the Labor Party said no. They said we don't want them to do that. Now, fortunately, we've been able to pursue that through the parliament. Now that we've got around two million women who hold a low balance uh, with inactive accounts, and uh, that will be protected from erosion through the excessive fees and inappropriate insurance arrangements that we are getting rid of as a government. They are the measures that we're pursuing that I announced in this year's uh, budget. Around 1.6 million who are still contributing to low balance accounts will see hundreds of millions of dollars of worth of savings from those measures. 1.3 million women will have their retirement savings boosted by around 2.5 billion thanks to being proactively reunited with their lost and low and inactive balances. So, Mr. Speaker, as a government, we've been acting on these issues. We've been acting on these issues. That's why, that's why we're seeing the gender pay gap, for example, on women's issues and women in the workforce fall from 17.2 per cent when we came to government to 14.5 per cent. Now, the gender pay gap, the gender pay gap under the previous government, under the Labor government, who always talks a big game on this, but the gender pay gap under the Labor government went from 15.5 per cent up to 17.2 per cent. Don't listen to what Labor promised you. You can rely Member on what our Gordon. government has Member done and will continue to do. The member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister advise the House on how the government is standing with Australian families to keep Australians safe and to keep Australians together. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Leichhardt for his question. Our government is standing with the families of Australia. We are standing with them to ensure that the essential services that they rely on are guaranteed, not by words, but by running a strong economy to ensure that the economy continues to grow and Australians are in work and can support and provide the services, whether they're Medicare, whether they're affordable medicines, whether they're record schools and hospitals funding, these are supported by a government that knows how to run a strong economy and knows how to keep the finances of this country under control. Mr. Speaker. Now, we believe Australians should keep more of what they earn and we believe Australian families should keep more of what they earn. That's why we have legislated opposed by those opposite, 
personal income tax relief right across the board, Mr. Speaker. $144 billion worth of personal tax relief to Australians right across the board, which the Labor Party wants to cut in half by $70 billion, Mr. Speaker, and we are focused and have legislated that tax relief which has already commenced. We're backing family businesses with lower taxes for small and family businesses. We are getting Australians into work, particularly young Australians. More than 200,000 Sorry, 100,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, were created in last financial year of young people getting into work, and Australian families celebrate those successes for their young people. And that's been achieved by the hard work of Australian businesses who have been giving young people a go under our policies. Our plans to get electricity prices down will be supporting families across Australia. The Labor Party's plan on electricity prices is to put them up by $1,400 per household by increasing the emissions reduction target from 26 per cent to 45 per cent. And more than that, they'll make it law, Mr Speaker. They will legislate for higher electricity prices if they ever come to government. Now, Mr Speaker, record schools funding uh, protecting children online. But today, we, attack, we have taken strong action, and I will welcome the strong support from the opposition, which I know will be forthcoming, to take actions on the concerns of Australian families about the contamination of food, in particular strawberries, and uh, the, what is basically an act of absolute idiocy on the Australian people and on Australian families. We're taking action on that by increasing the penalties for those engaged in this food tampering. We're taking action on that by introducing a new provision uh, on recklessness, which means that any idiot that wants to go into a grocery store or a fruit and veg store and stick pins in fruit, they will face penalties up to 10 years in prison, Mr Speaker. And we want that bill done and out of this parliament before we rise and go from this place. And I thank the opposition for their support for achieving that, Mr Speaker. We're taking action with a million dollars extra, supporting what has been done in Queensland. I commend the Queensland government for doing that through support for the industry and food standards. Mr Speaker, this weekend, support our strawberry farmers. Make a pav. The Leader of the Opposition on indulgence. Just on indulgence, I seek to associate Labor with the uh, last 45 seconds of the Prime Minister's answer with reference to the strawberry uh, situation. Labor hasn't been fully, uh, been fully briefed on the complete detail, but I can assure Australians that we will work with the government on supporting farmers. And deterring and stopping these despicable acts. The broader message to the Australian community is also important. Strawberry growers in Queensland are already being hard hit, and in Victoria, in the Yarra Valley, the Speaker's area and others, uh, we're coming into season for strawberries from the beginning of October. I want to quote and echo the comments of the President of Strawberry Australia, John Carl, a uh, grower in the Yarra Valley. He said, strawberries are so easy to eat, just cut them up before eating. Uh, we want to say to Australians, a few isolated cases there's no reason to stop buying strawberries. Keep having them with your breakfast. Keep supporting our growers. Just cut the berries up. Don't cut the farmers out. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that this government has hit the retirement savings of Australian women by supporting cuts to penalty rates, abolishing the low-income superannuation contribution before being shamed into bringing it back, and delaying the increase in the superannuation guarantee. Doesn't this just confirm that this government's failure to increase the representation of women in important national institutions has a real and lasting impact on the everyday lives of Australian women? The Minister for Jobs, Industrial Relations and Women. I thank the member for her question. And it is very important to place on the record that there has been no cut to penalty rates by the government. The government has made no decision to cut penalty rates as she members well on my knows. left. The when the Leader first. of the Opposition was the Minister responsible, he was involved in setting up the Fair Work Commission. The Fair Work Commission and all of the architecture around it can be laid at the feet of the Leader of the Deputy Opposition. Leader of the, opposition. Of course, the Fair Work Commission has made decisions regarding penalty rates for five awards. And they haven't abolished those penalty rates for the awards as those opposite would have us believe, but they have made some adjustments. Now, um, 
What, what they have done, for instance, for public holidays is they have changed the Fair Work Commission has changed it from double time and a half to double time and a quarter. Right? So it still is there. So it's completely false for the deputy leader to make that suggestion. And it deserves it deserves to be called out in Members this on place. My left. But as she as she should know, it is the people who are sitting on this side of the chamber who have been working hard to ensure the financial security of Australian women. We have been doing that because we have wanted to increase the job opportunities for Australian women. And under our government, there are more women in work than ever before. It is very hard, it is very hard to be on a path to financial security Member if you Bruce. do not have a job. And it is this side of the House that has been working incredibly hard to put in place important superannuation reforms that would provide flexibility so that women who want to actually catch up on their superannuation contributions can do so under our measures, measures that would be scrapped by those opposite. We've levelled the playing field. We've levelled the playing field to make sure that anyone, regardless of their circumstances, can make a personal deduction and have the same concessions with their superannuation, which cost us more than a billion dollars to do that. But the thing that they could really do to actually help the security of Australian women would be to support the government's protecting your super legislation. That legislation would protect Australian workers, protect hard-working Australian people from the rorts and rip-offs that have occurred in the superannuation sector. But they are going to stand with high fee-paying funds, high fee-charging funds, and they are going to stand with big insurers, not the, the Australian people. The Minister's time people. has concluded. The Prime Minister on indulgence. Yeah, Mr Speaker, I should have uh, made this statement to the House earlier. The Treasurer will be absent from question time today, as it is Yom Kippur, and I will answer questions on his behalf, and I will also answer questions on behalf of the Special Minister of State. Thank you. The member for Fisher. And my question is to the Attorney-General. Uh, as the attorney knows, the seat of Fisher is home to many strawberry growers who have been hit hard by recent events. Will the attorney update the House on steps our government is taking to strengthen Commonwealth laws guaranteeing Australians food safety and dealing appropriately with those who seek to sabotage our food supply? The attorney general has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for his question. And he and I both have electorates with many uh, market gardeners and fruit growers. And I've come to know people in my electorate like Anthony and Leanne at Berry Sweet Farms in Bullsbrook. And that's a couple who have worked their entire lives to build a great business employing local people. So to see all their hard work now put in jeopardy by the despicable and senseless criminal acts of a small number of perpetrators across Australia is just heartbreaking. And I know everyone in this parliament agrees that we owe it to these hardworking people and your and my electorate. Uh, to do everything in our power to stem the tide of this wanton and shocking behaviour. As part of this response, I can inform the House that after being tasked by the Prime Minister yesterday to provide advice as to how this parliament might improve and strengthen the offences which criminalise this grotesque behaviour, our government will proceed with urgency to effect two changes to the Commonwealth criminal law. And while the drafting is being finalised, I can inform the House as to how that drafting will generally operate. Presently, section 380 of the Criminal Code sets out what are known as contamination offences. The four existing offences relating to contaminating food with the intention to cause public alarm or anxiety, or the intention to cause significant economic loss, or the intention to cause harm to public health, they will have their maximums increase from 10 to 15 years, making them comparably serious offences, comparable to offences such as sex offences and financing terrorism, because that's what this is, a terrible and serious offence. Four new offences will also be created with 10-year maximums, and they would be created in a way that would not require proof beyond reasonable doubt of intention, but rather proof of recklessness as to outcomes. The point, members, here being that anyone who chose to argue that it couldn't be shown beyond reasonable doubt that they had the intention to cause loss or harm would no longer be able to escape prosecution and penalty. 
And finally, we are looking to create amendments to the sabotage offences in Division 82 of the Criminal Code. Now, this would be achieved by amending what was a relatively new definition of sabotage, which was meant to cover sabotage of uh, supply of important goods such as electricity and water, and to extend that definition to goods intended for human consumption. Now, the point here is that on a larger scale, we have recently determined that it is appropriate that sabotage include uh, electricity and water provision, but what this unprecedented criminal behaviour has shown to us is that food supply chains can be just as important to Australians' well-being and so to our national security as the provision of water and electricity. Yeah. So, if I can conclude by saying, while there are already serious crimes at Commonwealth law and in each of the states and the territories, this parliament has an opportunity to act in a bipartisan way to help people like Anthony and Leanne by responding even more forcefully to this type of terrible criminality. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, people earning less than $450 a month don't have to be paid superannuation. This means that many women in low-paid or casual jobs can't build up their retirement savings. When will the government stop fighting itself, start governing, and match Labor's commitment to help women in low-paid and casual jobs plan for security in retirement by ensuring that superannuation is paid to those Australians earning less than $450 a month? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. The government has acted to support people on low incomes. The low income superannuation tax offset, Mr Speaker, that supported 1.9 million Australian women. That was, in, that was in the budget I handed the down, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister Speaker. will resume his seat. The members for Griffith and Fenner will leave under 94A. The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the, our government has acted to provide catch-up contributions for women in the workforce. Our government has acted for those women who are starting their own businesses, particularly those working from home, can now access the superannuation tax concessions that others, that others can access. Mr. Speaker. And I, I don't understand why the Labor Party opposed those measures. Why would the Labor Party want to oppose someone running their own business from home getting access to the same superannuation tax concessions that are enjoyed by all other female workers, Mr Speaker. Now, these provisions particularly support those in trades and small businesses, but it does include those who run their own home-based businesses. What that shows is, Mr Speaker, they're happy, to, they're happy to support the superannuation savings of those who are in the union workforce, Mr Speaker, but they're not happy to support the superannuation savings of people who run small and medium-sized businesses, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party has never understood the psychology or the incentive or the mindset of someone who decides to run their own business, who wants the independence and takes the risk and goes out there to ensure that they can provide for their future. And Mr Speaker, that, that betrayal by the Labor Party is also demonstrated. They want to talk about retirement savings. If they're so interested in retirement savings, why do they want to put their hands in the pocket of senior Australians who have saved and take around five billion dollars out of their savings? Out of their savings, and do you know, do you know who the biggest burden of that retirees tax falls on, Mr. Speaker? Women. 30 per cent more women will be impacted by the Labor Party's retirees member for Bert, retiree tax, the member for Bertie's ward. sucking $5 billion out of the pockets and hard-earned savings of Australian families. And at that time, when women are on their own, when their partners may have been deceased and passed on, Mr Speaker, what was left to them what was left to them in the shares that they had in Telstra or the shares that they had in whatever Australian company they had, that's the money, that's the money, that shadow treasurer, that leader, leader of the Labor Party wants to get their grubby hands on, and we won't allow it. Just before I call the member for Denison, I'd like to inform the House that we have joining us in the gallery this afternoon a parliamentary delegation from the Sarawak State Legislative Assembly. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you all. And I've also been advised that uh, we have the former member for Shortland, Jill Hall, uh, with us in the Norm Northern Gallery. A uh, welcome to you. The member for Denison has the call. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, Tasmanians are routinely waiting years to see a specialist, 
and literally dying while waiting for surgery. Congestion at the Royal Hobart Hospital is now so bad that people sleep on the floor of the emergency department waiting area. Inpatients are held for up to five days in the ED until a bed can be found in a ward, including mental health wards. And there's even a proposal for patients to be accommodated in alcoves and storerooms. Prime Minister, do you think that this is okay? And will you reach out to the uninterested Tasmanian government and help it remedy a public health system beyond its competency to run effectively? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I don't think it's okay. But I also believe that the Tasmanian government, led by Premier Will Hodgman, is exactly the right government to deal with the problems that you've been highlighting, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister for Health has written to the Tasmanian government seeking an update on the issues that you've raised today. I saw that report on the front page of the Merck today also. But the member would also be aware that the Commonwealth does provide significant funding support to hospitals, public hospitals in particular, not just in Tasmania but all around the country. But particularly when we look at what has been done in terms of Tasmania and Commonwealth public funding, um, the Commonwealth was investing $294 million when we came to office in hospitals in Tasmania. That has now increased by 42.5 per cent under our government to now $419 million this year. And we were pleased that the Hodgman government was also one of the first to sign on to the new hospitals agreement, which has been negotiated by the Minister for Health, Mr. Speaker, which is delivering record Commonwealth government funding to Tasmanian hospitals out to 24-25. In the five years from 2020, under the new agreement, Tasmania's public hospitals will receive an additional $373.6 million, growing at 18.4 per cent over that period. Now, in addition to that, you will be aware of the $730 million to the Tasmanian government to secure the long-term future of the Mersey Hospital uh, in Latrobe for a decade. You will also be aware that the funding means more services, more doctors and more nurses. At the Royal Hobart Hus Hospital in particular, this funding is delivering significant growth in elective surgeries being performed from 6,740 when, we first, when our government first came to government to 7,755 in 2016-17 on the figures we have available. Now, in terms of mental health support for Tasmania, the Commonwealth through Primary Health Tasmania has increased, uh, has invested, I should say, 34.58 million to commission mental health and suicide prevention services. Mr. Speaker, we are delivering record funding to hospitals and health around this country, Mr. Speaker, Member for Bass. and we will continue to do that. We will ensure that the support is there for our state governments who have the carriage of delivering those services across all the states. And the reason we are going to be able to do that and the reason why Tasmanians can count on that is because we are running a strong economy, which means we can generate the revenue, not from higher taxes, but from, the revenue, but from a stronger economy to deliver what Tasmanians need. I, the member for Denison had risen on a point of order. I'm sorry you didn't catch my, my eye earlier. I apologise for that. On, on relevance, the question goes to much more than just financial funding the, for the states, but also um, what other assistance the federal government might be able to give Tasmania. Yes, I thank the member for Denison. The Prime Minister has indicated to me he's concluded his answer. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister advise the House how the government is standing with Australian family businesses to keep our economy strong? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for his question. Earlier today, I was uh, talking to Gavin Skur, and Gavin Skur uh, runs a, a strawberry farm up in Caboolture, uh, which would be known to the member for Longman. And we spoke today about the terrible impact that is happening not just to his business but about 120 other um, uh, growers up there in Queensland in particular. And they've seen demand for strawberries drop by 50 per cent. Now, our action today, working with other agencies, state governments and others, the million dollars we put in as well uh, to support quality standards and supporting the industry, and on top of that the additional penalties to ensure that we can prevent any further uh, idiotic behaviour by people uh, going in and tampering with the fruit that children eat in this country. The reason we've done this 
is we want to protect Australian families, but we also are never slow to act to support Australian family businesses like Gavin Skurs. Now, there are many other issues we have to deal with when it comes to this, and the Speaker will be very well aware of this issue, having strawberry farmers in his own electorate, Mr Speaker. You would be aware of that. I mean, there are the issues that remain of ensuring that we protect the fields themselves. And we do know if they can't pick the strawberries, as Gavin was re um, reminding me of today, then those entire fields are at risk of being walked away from. Now, I'm, I'm hopeful and looking forward to the further initiatives that the state government will take in that area, and we're happy to work with them to the extent that those responsibilities fall to the Commonwealth government. But we are very pleased to work, whether it's the Queensland government or any other government, to protect our farmers, and in this case we're talking about our strawberry farmers, to ensure that their businesses can return to as normal as possible as soon as possible. And, uh, so it is about uh, not, not uh, cutting them up, not cutting it out, Mr Speaker. It is about rest just returning to, to your normal consumption of strawberries and taking the sensible precautions. But that's not the only thing we're doing to support small and family business around this country as a government. We've been doing it for five years, and that support has meant lower taxes, which the Labor Party will increase. It is their stated and published policy that they will increase the legislated tax reductions to 25 per cent that we have taken through this parliament. They will increase it up to 27.5 per cent. Mr. Speaker. That's what they will do. That's their policy. If you run a small or medium-sized business, or if you're one of the seven million Australians who work in one of those businesses with a turnover of under $50 million, you are going to be working in a business, if Labor is elected at the next election, that will be paying higher taxes. And I've never understood, Mr Speaker, how Labor thinks if a taxpayer or in particular a business has to pay more tax to the government, how they can invest more in their business, invest more in their employees, invest more in the business that they put their whole livelihood into. The instant asset write-off, the simplification of the BAS, the extending the definition of a small business to two to ten million. That's what we've done. The We're going to keep doing it. Time has concluded. The member for Franklin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care. Is the minister aware of a report that while visiting a nursing home in May, he conceded the government's $1.2 billion cuts to aged care was hurting, saying, and I quote, these things are controlled by Treasury. Can the minister confirm that he now blames the Prime Minister, the then Treasurer, for the $1.2 billion cut to aged care? And is this why the Prime Minister described his own government as a Muppet show? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The report in the paper is not accurate, and it is not a comment that I would make when I'm in an aged care facility. The decisions around funding and our increased funding, going from 13.7 to 18.6 to 23.6, is an increase, and our budgets are continuing to grow. In terms of the ACFI instrument. The work that's being undertaken at the moment is looking at the RUCS program, and we will continue to work with the department on the reforms that are required. Thank you, Speaker. The member for Groom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the Minister update the House on action our government is taking to empower authorities to protect Australian families? in our community. And I also ask what are the alternatives to this approach? The Minister for Home Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. I really want to uh, start, Mr Speaker, by commending the policing agencies, in particular the Queensland Police, for the work that they've led in relation to this terrible circumstance around strawberries. Uh, at this point in time, I can report to the House and to the Australian public that there are now over 100 cases reported, and many of those will be hoax or copycat cases. But this is a very serious issue. And the Prime Minister moved very swiftly this morning to make an announcement in relation to, go to our government's uh, response, and that is that we will improve the laws. But I also want to thank the Australian Federal Police for their involvement, the Australian Border Force for their involvement uh, with the other policing agencies. This now reaches well beyond Queensland to almost every jurisdiction 
across the country. And my appeal, Mr. Speaker, is to people who are posting false images onto Facebook or onto Twitter, please don't do it. It's a diversion of police resources. They are concentrating on trying to find the perpetrators of what is a very serious crime, and they don't want their resources diverted trying to look at each of these cases, which are either copycat cases or hoaxes. It will delay them finding the person who is truly responsible for the original crime. It has, as the Prime Minister has pointed out, a negative impact not just on families but on farmers and their families as well, and the government will provide whatever support we can through our law enforcement agencies to bolster the efforts of the national response which is being led by Queensland. I also Mr. Speaker, want to take the opportunity today to acknowledge work being done by the Australian Federal Police in concert with the other state policing agencies and, in fact, all law enforcement agencies across the country in relation to countering child exploitation. Mm -hmm. This is a serious threat to families. Mums and dads are worried about their kids online. They're worried about images being uploaded. They're worried about predators not just in the park or next door or down the street, but they're worried about kids online and the hours that they're spending online. And last week or we announced a $70 million investment into the Centre for Countering Child Exploitation, and that is a Commonwealth-led effort, Mr Speaker, but it involves the other policing agencies as well. We know that, shockingly, every seven minutes a web page shows a child being sexually abused. We know that through the money that we've put into the Australian Federal Police, they have received additional funding in the 2018-19 budget. It includes that $70 million I spoke of before. The centre is expected to remove over 200 children from danger in the first year alone, and it builds on the work that we've done to cancel the visas of people who have been involved in sexual offences against children and women, and we will build on that work every day of this government. Yeah. The member for Franklin. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care, and I refer to his previous answer where he denied blaming the new Prime Minister for hurting the aged care sector with a $1.2 billion cut. If it wasn't the now Prime Minister's fault, exactly which person in the government was responsible for cutting $1.2 billion from aged care? Member for Goldstone. The Minister, Member for Morton. The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care has the call. Repeating that, I thank, Mr Speaker, thank you. I thank the member for Franklin and I apologise for not acknowledging you on the previous question. I thank you for your question, but the question you ask is inaccurate. We have continued to increase fund funding, as I said, from $13.1 billion through to $18.6 through to another $5 billion to $23.6 and we are continuing to have work undertaken in respect to the ACFI instrument. The ACFI instrument yeah. has served the sector well. And let me say that the funding instrument was capped at a time in which there were claims that were much higher than the trajectory. And all governments have a responsibility to live within their means and within the budget that's established. Now, but we have not cut because we have continued to grow the ACFI level of funding over the forward estimates, and they will continue to grow. But the new RUX program that we are working with the Wollongong University with will provide a better instrument for better assessing people, as you heard in the Four Corners program, by their own admission, staff were told to game the instrument. The rucks will go to the absolute aspect of quality of care, complex care conditions and dementia and mental health needs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just before I uh, call the member for Flynn, we are just having join us right now on the floor of the House a delegation from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to you. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr. De Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the government 
is supporting regional Australian families and strengthening local communities by investing in critical infrastructure. How would diff different views affect regional Australia? Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I do thank the good member for Flynn for his question. Uh, thanks to our good economic management, our good economic plan, we can look after regional families, we can look after regional farmers, we can look after drought-affected communities, and we can back small family-owned regional small businesses. And that's what we're doing. We're supporting regional families throughout the drought. And uh, unfortunately, it is prolonged and it is ongoing. Uh, we've provided $1.8 billion worth of assistance. We can, we need to, and we must do more, and we will. Uh, we're supporting local governments uh, in 60 drought affected regions, 60 drought affected councils to speed up local infrastructure works and generate local jobs in those councils. Uh, we're also supporting strawberry farmers, and of course that's uh, important. I appreciate the bipartisan support that's been offered, but we need to obviously support our strawberry producers during this crisis. We're also supporting such places as the Gladstone St Vincent de Paul. Now, St Finney's do a wonderful job right across the nation, and certainly so in Gladstone. We've provided $492,000 through the Building Better Regions Fund, providing uh, air conditioning, uh, better storage and a much-needed facelift for the centre there in Gladstone. Uh, and we're also providing money uh, for farming families. I've asked about uh, regional, uh, regional farming families, family-owned and operated trucking transport companies, uh, such as those uh, who operate the uh, road transport uh, uh, link, that uh, road transit link between uh, Gracemere, the sale yards there, and the North Rockhampton abattoirs. And uh, it's it's not, as Labor would have it, uh, a measure that, uh, under the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, that ill-conceived, ill-named tribunal, they would force that sort of company, those sorts of companies that operate that sort of route off the road. They would, they would send it off the road. But we're supporting them through better infrastructure, a $30 million piece of infrastructure that I know the member for Flynn and uh, the member for Capricornia are so supportive of. But we're getting on with the job of also fixing Labor's mess that they left behind, such as the independent youth allowance, helping country students to get a fair go. There are 17,000 small businesses in the member for Flynn's electorate. We're backing them. We're backing them with lower taxes. We're backing them with lower power prices. But if those opposite get into government, they'll jack the prices up for power. They'll jack the taxes up. That's what they do. They'll put a wrecking ball, a wrecking ball through the economy, a wrecking ball. I can just see the uh, member for Maramanong on his wrecking ball going right through retiree savings in the member for Flynn's electorate, the regional funding programs. They'll be gone. They'll be gone. Higher taxes and, uh, and the Queensland land management laws, those ill-conceived, ill-named native vegetation laws, they'll become, they'll become national. They'll become national. That's what this man stands for. That's what he stands for. Higher taxes, higher power prices, and God help those small businesses in Flynn and elsewhere. The member for Franklin. Thank you. My question is again for the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care. Minister, has the per resident funding for the complex high care aged care funding instrument gone down as a result of the 2016 budget? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care. The member for McEwen will cease interjecting. The Deputy Speaker. Speaker. Oh, sorry, Speaker, thank you. I thank the member for Franklin for her question. Based on the latest data in 2017-18, the average Australian government payment subsidy plus supplement for a permanent resident in residential care was $66,000 per resident. This compares to $53,000 in 2012-13, which was Labor's last financial year. This was an increase of $2,900,000 per on my right. 24%. Members on my right will cease interjecting. The member for Franklin on a point of order. <laughs> to be directly re relevant, Speaker, he needs to answer has it gone down as a result of the 2016 budget, not compare yeah. it to 2012? Yeah. The member for Franklin will resume her seat. I haven't called the minister yet. If the minister can just wait, I'll rule on the point of order. And if members on my right could not interject, I can add. No, the minister doesn't have the call. The minister doesn't have the call. I say, if members on my right can cease interjecting, I can actually hear the point of order properly. 
the uh, I can't believe the member for Gorton can't hear me. He's three feet away. <laughs> We're less than 30 seconds into the minister's answer. He's being relevant to the subject matter. I'm listening to the minister very carefully, and I do point out that it was a very specific question, and the minister is entitled to give some context at the beginning of his answer. I'll call the minister and I'll... The funding for ACV expenditure has continued to increase against claims across all three domains. I thank you, oh, Speaker. Oh, yeah. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Members on both sides, Leader of the House. The member for Boothby. Has Thank you, Mr. Order. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Jobs, Industrial Relations and Women. Will the Minister update the House on measures the government is taking to support Australian families by helping working women enjoy greater financial security in retirement? Is the minister aware of any threats posed by alternative approaches? The Minister for Jobs, Industrial Relations and Women. I thank the member for her question. and She knows, like all of those on this side of the chamber, that the best form of financial security is to be able to get and keep a job. And I'm pleased to say that there are more Australians in work than ever before. And under this government, there are more women in work than ever before. And the gender pay gap, the gender pay gap is shrinking under our stewardship. It was 17.2 per cent under the Labor Party. It went up under the Labor Party from 15.5, and it has come down Members on my left. under us to 14.5 per cent. It is, in fact, at a record low. We've also introduced crucial flexibility measures to allow women with interrupted work patterns to make catch-up superannuation contributions. Something that those opposite would abolish. We've levelled the playing field. We've scrapped the restrictions on personal deductible contributions, helping those women in particular who work in roles without access to salary sacrificing arrangements. And again, those opposite would abolish this. And this government has introduced crucial reform legislation that would stop the rorts and the rip-offs that have been occurring in the superannuation sector and provide significant financial security to millions of Australian women. Now, you would think if those opposite are actually interested in financial security, if they really want better incomes in retirement, you would think that they would in fact support that package of reforms. But sadly, I can inform the House that they do not support it. Those opposite pretend to care about the retirement savings of millions of Australian women, but if they really cared, they would stop standing arm in arm with giant insurance companies and protecting high fee charging superannuation funds. They would, in fact, back the government's reforms. But why? Why don't they do that? Well, because they've got a dirty little secret. The dirty little secret is that the Leader of the Opposition, when he was the minister responsible, he scrapped the protections for low balance accounts for the high fees and he forced every single Australian, regardless of age or circumstance, to pay insurance premiums. So we hear from them excuse after excuse after excuse as to why it is they can't support it. But they should be clear with the Australian people. In standing in the way of these reforms, the Labor Party are costing millions of Australian women billions, billions of dollars in retirement. So if they really care, stand with us, be bipartisan, support the legislation. The that we're members, Minister's time has concluded. The member for McMahon. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has cancelled the scheduled Council of Australian Governments meeting because his government is too busy fighting itself to finalise vital funding for schools and hospitals. And the last time this House sat, the government cancelled Parliament because it was unwilling and unable to govern. Doesn't this just, doesn't this just confirm that the government is too busy fighting itself to govern for Australians 
And is this what the Prime Minister meant when he called his own government the Muppet Show? The Prime Minister has the call. What the member's question reveals is that he doesn't have a clue. He doesn't have an absolute clue, Mr Speaker. There are two co-ags co are being held this year. And you know why we're not having co-ag in October? Because we're having a drought summit. That's what we're doing. That's what I announced today. We're having a drought summit in Members October. Members on my left. Now, the jeers that come from the opposition and the Labor Party when I say we're having a drought summit, Mr Speaker, tells us a bit about where their priorities are. They want to come in here, they want Members to come in here right. and go on with all this political rubbish day after day after day. Earlier today, I, I met with the Deputy Prime Minister and I met with the, with the Special Envoy, the, the member for New England. I met with the head of the National Farmers Federation. I met with Major General Stephen Day, Mr Speaker, and we received an update on the report of the work that has been done by Major General Stephen Day, who is coordinating the government's response to the drought. And on the 26th of October, as we will bring together people from around the country, I'll be inviting all the state and territory leaders or their nominees or those within their government who are directly involved in coordinating the drought response to come and align all of our efforts to ensure that we're doing a number of things. Firstly, that we're getting the feed to where it needs to get to, Mr Speaker, to support the efforts of our farmers to keep their properties going and to keep them in business, to support the towns, to support the centres, to make sure not only the farms keep the going, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister will you resume ask me his seat. Prime Minister will resume his seat. The, the Deputy Prime Minister. The Deputy Prime Minister will not try and conduct a discussion with me. It'll end badly. The manager of opposition business is on his feet and is seeking to raise a point of order, I presume, the manager of opposition business. Thanks, Speaker. On, on direct relevance, the question went to a COAG meeting that was scheduled for the 4th of October, not the drought summit, which is scheduled for the 26th of October. He was asked about a different meeting. Just before I call the Prime Minister, if members on my left can cease interjecting, the member for Kingston Smith. The Prime Minister addressed uh, the question in the very first couple of sentences. Uh, I believe the Prime Minister is in order. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Watson must think this is some sort of high school debating chamber where he comes in and makes cheap debating points. The fact is, Prime Mr. Minister, Speaker, we'll just pause. Prime Minister, if you just pause for a second. The member for Morton uh, can leave the chamber. That will lower the temperature. Thank you, and Mr. Under 94A. Thank you, well, Mr. It's, 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 I've got to say, with some members, it's sequential every day. I mean, they interject. They're told not to interject. They keep interjecting, and they leave. So it's, um, it's pretty straightforward. The, the member for McEwen will not reflect on me. The Prime Minister has the Thank call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The two items that were going to be addressed at the COAG meeting related to the education funding arrangements, which is being pursued by the Education Minister's uh, Council, as well as the Council of Federal Financial Relations, who have advised the Premiers when I spoke to them directly about this, that these issues will be resolved in time for when that meeting would have been held anyway. So those issues do not require a special meeting of COAG in October. What we do require in October is a national drought summit to coordinate the entire national effort, not only of the state and territory uh, governments, but the Commonwealth, the charitable sector, the farming sector, the meat producers, all of these groups coming together to focus on what is my priority. My priority, Mr Speaker, is not to hold a bunch of meetings. My priority is to get things done, Mr Speaker. I, I suspect the, the now shadow Treasurer and when he was Minister for Immigration, plen had plenty of meetings about how he might want to stop the boats. He didn't stop one. He could have as many meetings as he'd like, and he achieved absolutely nothing. Now, Mr. Speaker, the what Prime I'm doing Minister's time has is focusing concluded. on the. The member for Brisbane has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry, <laughs> Science and Technology. Will the minister update the House on the steps our government is taking to support small and family businesses 
creating local jobs and new business opportunities? And is the minister aware of any threats to the livelihoods of Australian family businesses? The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Brisbane for his question. He is well known and well regarded as a very strong advocate of small and family businesses. He, like so many people on this side of the chamber, truly understands small and family businesses. We understand how hard it can be as a small and family business, and we want to help them to succeed. We want to help them to grow. We're doing that firstly through legislated tax cuts, and we're also looking to support them grow and create new opportunities and create new jobs. Now, in the member for Brisbane's electorate, there is a, a company that I know that the Prime Minister uh, visited not so long ago. That business is iOrthotics, and uh, he visited about uh, 18 months or so ago, uh, Prime Minister, with uh, the member for Brisbane. Now, iOrthotics is a great local business. They are employing local people and they're taking their business to the world. They're pioneering the next wave of 3D printing, and they're already supplying more than 100 clinics across Australia with their products. They have plans to reach out to a number of overseas countries, the United States, the United Kingdom and also to Canada. Importantly, they have worked with the government's Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre to digitise and to upscale their manufacturing processes. They are planning and expecting to grow their current exports considerably over the coming years. And as a result of that, they will increase the number of skilled jobs that they have. iOrthotics has a forecast to increase their sales revenue from $940,000 in 2018 to $2.82 million in 2019. Now, that's a great Queensland uh, company, one that's becoming even greater thanks to the opportunities and the new jobs that are being created by this government, Mr Speaker. And unlike those opposite, Mr Speaker, we are backing our small and family businesses because we understand that they're the foundation of the local communities on which this country is built. We are working hard to make sure that we are creating jobs, that we are creating opportunities uh, for them into the future. Just today, I launched the Small and Medium Enterprises Export Hub program. This is a $20 million program, which is part of the Taking Local Businesses Global initiative that was announced in the last budget. What this will do is create export hubs. It will create regional centres that will help our local businesses, businesses like Orthotics, to actually take on the world. This is just another demonstration of this government's commitment to small and family businesses. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has cancelled the scheduled Council of Australian Governments meeting because his government is too busy fighting itself to finalise vital funding for schools. How are principals, teachers and parents in public schools supposed to plan for the coming school year when they've got no funding certainty for 2019? Isn't the division and chaos in this government hurting our schools and hurting our children? <coughs> Is this what the Prime Minister meant when he described his own government as a Muppet show? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Look, when people Member tell lies and repeat them, Mr Speaker, that doesn't make them any more true. That is, that is a fundamental principle. When people the Deputy think Leader they can of the tell opposition lies has asked and repeat question. lies, it doesn't make them any more true the more you repeat them. Members the Australian of people know that, Mr Speaker. At, Mr Speaker, what I made very plain Deputy Leader of the in my opposition. answer to the last question was simply this. I don't think you need to have a meeting if you don't need to have a meeting. You don't have a meeting just to you know, book the hall and everybody can come and have a cup of tea. And the reason we don't have to have that meeting, Mr Speaker, is because the very education funding Member for issues— Rankin. The very education funding issues that are referred to by the member will be addressed within that time frame. The Minister for Education and the Treasurer, who is absent from the House today, will ensure that is the case, 
And that is the conversation I had with the premiers when I called each of them and I spoke to each of them, and none of them raised a concern with the meeting not being held because they knew where the progress of those matters when it came to education funding was up to. Previously, as Treasurer, I had been progressing those matters uh, through the Council of Federal Financial Relations, and they will be resolved, Mr Speaker. But on this side of the House, we don't think you have to have meetings just for the sake of it. You just get on and do the job, Mr Speaker. You just get on and do the job. Now the shadow treasurer has come up here and he's got all terribly irritated because there's not going to be a meeting, Mr Speaker. Well, what I know about the shadow treasurer is this. When he was immigration minister, people couldn't trust him on the borders and you can't trust him on a budget either. The Australian people know about me that they can trust me on the borders and they can trust me on the budget because that's my record. The member for Gray. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australian and Australians in Aged Care. Will the Minister update the House on how Australians can have their say through the Royal Commission into Quality and Safety in Aged Care? The Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care. The member for Indi knows the rules on props. The Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for Gray for his ongoing interest in uh, aged care and the way in which we look after senior Australians. In respect to the Royal Commission, it's an important step forward in looking at the total structure of the reforms that are needed in aged care. There will be numerous avenues for available Wills. for people to provide feedback to the terms of reference for the Royal Commission. A dedicated website has been established by the Department of Health titled consultation.health.gov.au. What I would encourage Australians to think about is the broad areas that we want to cover, that is the quality of care provided to senior Australians and the extent of substandard care, the challenge of providing care to Australians with disabilities living in residential aged care, particularly young people with disabilities the challenge of supporting the increasing number of Australians suffering dementia and addressing their care as they age, the future challenge and opportunities for delivering aged care services in the context of changing demographics, including remote, rural and regional Australia, and any other matters that the Royal Commission wishes to consider. In recognising the diverse needs of the community impacted by the aged care sector, I am committed to holding and ensuring a round of consultations on the Royal Commission and to hear the views of people. Consultations for the terms of reference is now open and will remain open until 25 September. In the next few days, we are working hard to get input on the terms of reference that the Commissioners will turn their mind to, and I encourage members from both sides of the House to encourage their constituencies to provide and communicate with that website and provide their thoughts. I'll be talking to a range of groups, mainly consumers, families, relatives and providers, in the days ahead. Just yesterday, the Prime Minister and I met with the leadership from the Aged Care Sector Committee and we sought their views. For those who just want to register their interest for information about the Commission, they can do it by leaving an email address for more information at https agedcare.govcms.gov.au announcement of Royal Commission into Aged Care and Safety. We are still committed to the existing reforms and we will not be stopping the pipeline of work that is continuing and that will remain the focus of this government and our government in ensuring the quality and safety of services provided to people both in residential care and in home care. I would encourage every member in this chamber to encourage their constituents, organisations, providers, culturally and linguistically diverse groups and all the diverse groups that we work with on a daily basis to make submissions because this is a significant path forward to providing aged care to all senior Australians that is important for both home and residential care. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. On 21 separate occasions since he became Prime Minister, he's failed to answer why Malcolm Turnbull isn't the Prime Minister of Australia. 
Given that he's had almost four weeks to work on his answer, he's now been asked the question 21 times. I ask again. Why isn't Malcolm Turnbull the Prime Minister of Australia? Members on my left, the member for Will, member for Wills, will cease interjecting. He's looking at me while he interjects. <laughs> the Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I'll further member to my earlier answers on this matter, and simply say that he's had five years, and he can't convince anyone that he should be the Prime Minister. The member for Goldstein. My question is to the Minister for Cities, Urban Infrastructure and Population. Will the Minister update the House on how our government's congestion-busting infrastructure agenda will relieve pressure on Australian families? And what are the alternatives to addressing congestion in this way? The Minister for Cities and Urban Infrastructure. Well, can I thank the member for Goldstein for his question? And as the member knows, Australia is one of the fastest growing countries in the world, both economically as well as population wise. But what that means is that some of our largest centres, such as Melbourne, Sydney, and South East Queensland, are really feeling the pressure because most of the growth is in those areas. And often that translates into congestion. What does that mean for everyday families? It means that they're spending more, times in, more time on the road and less time with their friends and family at home. Now, people in Brighton and Hampton and Goldstein know this, as do people in our congested suburbs right across Australia. Mr Speaker, the government has a plan to ease this congestion, and one of the most important elements of this plan is a massive investment in congestion-busting infrastructure. Yeah. Over the next 10 years, we are investing $75 billion worth of congestion-busting infrastructure into major roads, into rail, into other public transport infrastructure. And that means in places like Sydney, it's projects like Member West Connect Bruce. and North Connect. In Queensland, it's the Brisbane Metro, the Bruce Highway, the M1. In South Australia, the North-South Corridor. In, in, Met in Western Australia, the Metro Net and the Bridgewater Bridge in Tasmania. In and in the member for Goldstein's own home city of Melbourne, of course, we have the Monash Freeway being developed, we have the Monash Rail being funded, we have $5 billion towards the airport uh, rail, Mr. Speaker, finally connecting up the Tullamarine Airport to the city by rail. And of course, we have a $3 billion commitment to the East West Link, which I know particularly the member for Deakin the is very Bruce interested is in. And I'm asking, Mr. Speaker, about alternatives to our congestion busting plan. And in many cases across the nation, I'm sad to inform the House that Labor has failed to commit to many of these large scale congestion busting projects. And if I look just in Victoria and in Melbourne specifically, I look at the Monash Roville Rail, and there's no commitment there from the Labor Party. 55,000 students at the largest university campus in Australia, they'll have to wait decades should the Leader of the Opposition become Prime Minister. A look at the airport rail. They say they commit to it, but how much money they put towards it? Not a cent. It's going to be built by the Leader of the Opposition's hot air, apparently, rather than from serious dollars. Do you know the worst example in Victoria, which we know very well, is the fact that the Labor Party in Victoria spent $1.3 billion not to build a road by cancelling the east-west link, a vital piece of infrastructure which we have committed to, we the continue to commit to, as part of our plan. The Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Last Wednesday, in answer to a question, the Prime Minister undertook to come back to the House after making inquiries of his department secretary as to whether the Minister for Home Affairs excused himself for more discussions on childcare. Now that the Prime Minister has had a week to make those inquiries, did the Minister for Home Affairs excuse himself for more discussions on childcare? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I refer the member to the statement made by the Minister for Home Affairs in this chamber on this matter, and I have nothing further to report. Oh, 
The member for Bowman has the call. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question to the Minister for Education. Will the Minister update the House on action our government is taking uh, to provide childcare to Australian families to help parents get back into the workforce quicker? What are the alternatives to supporting families in this way? The Minister for Education has the call. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Bowman for his question. As he knows, the best start in life is a good education, and I know this is an issue that he takes incredibly seriously. The Liberal and National Government's new childcare package represents the most significant reforms to early education and care system in 40 years. Member for Kingston. When it commenced on 2 July 2018, more than one million families had successfully transitioned to the new arrangements. For the few families left to transition, and the member for Kingston might want to pay attention here, they have until 23 September this Sunday, this Sunday to access their Centrelink online account via MyGov and complete member their childcare Deacon. subsidy assessment. This is very important, and I would ask all the members of Barker. the House to ensure that this message is made known to all those parents. They will have their subsidy backdated to 2 July 2018. Over 99.9 per cent of all eligible childcare providers have transitioned to the new system. The Coalition is committed to quality, affordable childcare. The new childcare package is providing more access to subsidised childcare to the families who work the most and more financial support to the families who earn the least. Around one million Australian families who are balancing work and parental responsibilities are benefiting from the package. Families will benefit from the introduction of the activity test, which will provide them more hours of subsidised care by increasing their recognised activity. For example, if a parent undertook just four hours of volunteering per week, four hours of volunteering per week, they could receive 18 hours of subsidised care per week. Families who don't benefit are mainly those who don't meet the activity test earning high incomes over $350,000. The new package also includes a childcare safety net to help families who need a little extra support, such as grandparents, carers, foster carers and parents battling serious illness. As I've said, we want to make childcare more affordable, more flexible and more accessible. Contrast that, contrast that to those opposite who saw a 53 per cent increase in childcare costs when they were in office. A 53 per cent increase in childcare costs. The Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why won't the Prime Minister fulfil the commitment he made to the House last week and say whether or not the Minister for Home Affairs excused himself from all discussions on childcare? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Once again, I refer to the statement by the Minister uh, on the 13th of September where he said he had complied with the requirements under the Statement of Mineral Standards and the Cabinet Handbook, and I have taken advice in relation to my position, which puts the question beyond doubt. Now, Mr Speaker, the left. Cabinet Handbook is a public document. Here it is, public document. It's quite straightforward. Its wording is quite clear. It does not say whatever the opposition wants it to say to suit the political purposes they try to pursue in this parliament. The minister has answered the question. I have nothing further to report on that matter, Mr Speaker. I think it's been absolutely cleared up, and I'm happy for the matter to rest there. The member for Lyne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. Will the minister update the House on assistance our government is providing to Australian farming families uh, during this severe and prolonged drought? The Minister for Agriculture. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the honourable member for his question? And in fact, only today I met with one of his farmers 
uh, out of his electorate, a dairy farmer that is uh, seriously impacted by this drought. And he told me the impact it was having on his family and his community. And proudly, our government's responsibility during this drought is around looking after farming families, making sure that they can get through this drought with dignity. And we've increased the farm household assistance to 37,626. And in fact, we've only increased that recently by giving supplementary payments of $12,000 to farming families, 7,200 to individuals. And I can report to the House that since the legislation was passed on the 23rd of August, 2,363 applicants have been successful in increasing and accessing that supplementary payment. Our departments have worked as quickly as they can to make sure that that money hits those farming families to be able to put bread and butter on the table. This is about making sure that we can give farmers the dignity and respect they deserve during this drought, making sure that they can get their kids into sport on a, on a weekend. But we're not stopping there, Mr Speaker. On the 29th of July, I asked for a review into the farm household assistance to make sure that it was still fit for purpose, to ensure that it was giving the impact that it needed to those farming families and communities. And I'm proud to say that only this morning I met with the review team to be able to get the feedback that I was required and to give them direction to make sure that they're looking at every part of this, to ensure that even the supplementary activity payment that's putting $4,000 into each individual's hand to, to give them the opportunity to get new skills, to diversify their income streams, to look off farm for new income to make their businesses more resilient. But this is despite the fact, this is despite the fact that only last year we had surveyed those that came off the farm household assistance. And on that exit survey, almost 90 per cent of respondents felt that the FHA had improved their current financial circumstances and more than 50 per cent expect to stay on farm with greater in income and or less debt, because we've complemented them with rural financial councillors, the angels of this drought, that give them the direction and time to make the right decisions that they need. This is an important step about supporting families and communities in regional communities. They are the core of regional communities. They are the ones that are the, make the fabric of our regional and rural society. Without them, without them, our communities, our regional and rural communities die. Our small and regional communities will no longer be there. So it's important that we wrap our arms, we wrap our arms around those farm, farming families to ensure that they continue to strengthen regional and rural Australia. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After 23 questions, uh, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank the Prime Minister.